Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here in this webinar regarding the challenge of food chain. And we have very important people, I'm not talking about myself. I'm gonna present you the speakers who are here sharing this screen and this challenge with us. I will start with um, the represent representative of FAO in Brazil which is uh, Dr. Rafael Zavala. Hi, Rafael, good to see you. And he's doing a wonderful work in Brazil, always ready to support the initiatives regarding uh, sustainability and uh, ODS. Uh, we also have Marita Kokvizia, which is an ambientalist. She was a director of the World Bank for many years. She has a special interest in Amazonia because she was the one that brought to Brazil one of the most important projects in Amazonia. And besides, she's a very well-known um, environmentalist in the regarding in, in making speeches in many universities around the world. We have Liz Walpon, which, which is, uh, she is a CEO of Food Nation, a state of art program that's a reference for many countries regarding sustainability in the food chain. And last but not least, we have a Brazilian, Sibeli Silva, who is uh, doing a, a great work. She did for many years, she was at Embrapa. Now she is, has just entering as a coordinator of uh, mechanization, new technologies and genetic resources in the Ministry of Agriculture. And myself, I am the, the CEO from, of Green Rio, which is a, a bioeconomy platform. I, I'm doing this very quickly because we don't have so much time. And so I immediately go to my, my presentation. I don't want to be a spoiler, but uh, I'm quite sure that each one of our guests will do a very good presentation. We'll tackle all the issues, all the challenge of the food chain. So let me see if it works. I hope it works. Where am I? I'm here. Now I'm just getting there. I hope everybody's seeing. It's okay. Wonderful. So you see, just the guests I have introduced you. I hope you get familiar with these faces because they are really game changers. So to continue, well, this is uh, three topics just for a start, and the world population, you know, that's growing in number and consumption. Many food chains are not prepared for this continued growth, and world hunger is on the rise. Yet, an estimate of one third of all food produced globally is lost or goes to waste. How can we live with this cruel equation? How can we stand this situation that hunger and food waste go hand in hand. These are the challenges that we want to present here and see what solutions we can bring. Every, as is very known, the expression from farm to fork. And so this way that you see in the slide shows exactly this way that goes from the field and then the, the, the industry, the production, and then finally the consumer. But uh, I think that in this infographic that you see over there is missing a building when you see in the city or in the field, but uh, in, the, in the part of the consumer, which are the schools. I think the, the youth is a really the the youth engagement is really essential if we want to transform healthy and sustainable food system. I, I took, there is a, I know a very wise woman that, um, that was um, Zavala who presented me, uh, Najla Veloso, she's coordinator for consolidation of school feeding programs in Latin American Caribbean. And she highlights very much the importance of school feeding, how transversal it is because it dialogues with education, nutrition, repetition, non-learning. How, how important is this foundation when 
children are well fed with uh, food security and they learn how to what is the importance of what they are eating so i chose for my presentation this specific topic because i i'm not going to enter in the all of the other presentations who tackle other topics let me introduce a little bit what i do uh, the green hue is a green platform it started in 2012 as um, supposed to be a green platform to a green economy um, organic and uh, or sustainable agriculture but is a platform when i say because we have not only the conference but we have an exhibitor a, a space and we have startup space we have business meetings so it's like a hub where we try to bring the green players but since 2015 we are very much linked to bioeconomy that's why this reporter that you see there is a famous journalist that was there uh, talking exactly about bioeconomy in the field of bioeconomy but uh, i want to highlight this other circle the other picture that i'm showing here as you can see there is a crowded auditorium with more than 200 people and most of them are school cooks why they are there they, they are part of a, a very interesting project that we did in 2015 and 2016 when we invited five municipalities from the Estado do Rio de Janeiro and challenged their mayors to see what they could do to reduce fat, to reduce sugar uh, in the school food. And, uh, but the most important is that the school cooks were the main players in this scenario because if we if we don't bring them it's useless they should be they should feel that they belong to the project and i think this was the success and as you will see here uh, and then the following year at the end of the project uh, there was a it was beyond our expectation the result there was a reduction of fat salt sugar processed ultra processed pro products and on the other hand, there was an increase of fruits, vegetables, and fresh products. So as you can see, we have, we touched four, more than 400 school, school cooks, 91 schools, and 30,000, more than 30,000 students. So uh, when you see in the picture, the mayors receiving their certifications, their awards, and uh, one of the I can really confess you that was one of the highlights of my life when I saw this caravan arriving with more than 200 uh, school cooks. They enter in the venue of Green Hill, which is in Marina da Glória, singing Cidade Maravilhosa, and um, it was something that I will never forget. It's a project that touched 30,000 children. This is very important because somehow this a pity that didn't follow up, but I, I still have hope to rescue because they learn and the school cooks were multipliers of this healthy initiatives and the health, how to produce healthy meals for children. <laughs> At the moment, we are working with um, Dinamarca. You see, Liz, we are again very much involved with Dinamarca in a project uh, coordinated by Professor Bent Mikkelsen from the University of Copenhagen. And the, the purpose is exactly to investigate how to bring young people to transform health and sustainable food system and also digital learning technology. It's a collaboration and collaboration is key between China and Brazil build on experience of recently completed CISAM project in Denmark, coordinated by Professor Bent Mikkelsen. We have regular meetings, as you can see, we have a lot of Zoom, and all these happy faces that you see over there are people who belong to this project. A special thanks to Alessandra and Gisele, who are the team leaders the researchers team leaders. A special thanks to Instituto Verde Escola uh, in São Paulo, Colégio Pedro II, and Sesc Mesa Brasil is not, is not a school uh, at the moment, but they are helping very much with their expertise in food banks. So students from 10 to 16 years, 
uh, are involved in this project, a very interesting project. We have other collaborators too, besides the one I have also mentioned, FAO, we are very, thank you again, Rafael, for being there and the Center of Innovation, the, the Consulate of Denmark. Thank you, Tina, and when you and the Centro Federal de Educação Sérgio Sopoda Fonseca CFET, led by Professor João Quatro. Well, this is something that I want to highlight. Brazil has 41 million school meals a day. It's almost an Argentina per day, every day that receives school meals. So you can imagine what a revolution this means. Some children, is this the only meal they have during the day? So how important it is this law that the products of family farming and rural uh, family entrepreneurs, they, are the, they should be the suppliers of the school feeding, prioritizing whenever possible organic or agroecological. This is something that Brazil is very proud to present and not everybody knows that we have this law. And another thing that we are proud is the food guide for the Brazilian population. It's an internationally considered a reference, an official document from the Minister of Health that presents information, recommendations on adequate and healthy food. And I think maybe Sibel could complement if I miss something because the Ministry of Agriculture has a strong role in the scenario of the school meals. The food banks. The food banks is, a, is something that uh, I, I have to highlight the importance that SESC Mesa Brasil is presenting because uh, it's the most important food bank in Latin America against hunger and waste and the food and nutritional security program that operates in all states of Brazil and now they are working in Mesa no Campo, not only Mesa Brasil, so exactly because of the problem of the food waste from farm to fork. So as you can see, there is an, even in Amazonia, they try to, to bring food to whoever needs. And uh, I just want to leave this message because this is something that Sometimes people forget that we don't, do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So let's try to take, give back the earth to our children in a planetary, in a healthy planet. That's why I'm so happy to be in planetary health. Let's try to be a healthy planet. I hope that I can see you virtually or in presence, who knows, probably in December. Uh, in Green Hill, this is the venue that we are going to, to do, do a hybrid event. And uh, all of you are mostly invited. And I think I, I did in the right time, so I can follow up in the next presentation. Thank you very much. This will be available in YouTube and whoever wants to enter in contact. Here is my email. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with you. So stop share. I come back. And uh, let's see if I can I continue with Rafael. Rafael, I want, I'm going to upload a presentation. I'm going to upload all the presentations and then hopefully we have time to discuss among us. And, um, to, and each one can feel free to make questions to, to all the all the other speakers. Let me see, Rafael. Now it's my turn to present. Rafael, where are you? There you are. So far, so good. Presentation from the beginning. It's okay, Rafael. Yes. Oh, uh, one. Okay. Okay. So. The floor, the screen is yours, not the floor. The screen is yours. Oh, thank you, Bia. Indeed, you are like my first virtual Kobe friend. Because, <laughs> uh, we have like, uh, we just know each other by, by email. But le let me uh, start with a, a huge lesson of the Kobe pandemic. And it is, we must change. 
health systems in uh, many ways, in many countries, and we must change food systems. And we, we must uh, make use of the opportunity of the World Food Summit that is coming in this year in order to, to, to make uh, huge changes, in order to make feasible the farm to fork slogan that uh, Bia said, and also is in order to, to make it uh, possible to, uh, the, not just the right to food, but the right to healthy food to all people in this world. In many cases, when we think about food chains, uh, we, uh, we are like uh, making a synonym between food chains and food systems, and not at all. This is very different. As you can see in this diagram, uh, food supply chain is just a part, a, a, a core part indeed, but there are other things. Uh, uh, the, as you can see in the diagram, in the uh, lower part are the phases of uh, food security, availability, access, and, and use. And uh, the other one is uh, uh, stability. And in all the spectrum from the food production to the food consumption, there are more things than just distribution of food. There are drivers such as innovation of technology, uh, social cultural drivers, biophysical and environmental, and what it is very important, I, and I think it's, it's a huge challenge in, in the uh, school feeding programs, is the food environments. Os ambientes alimentados uh, nas escolas, ambientes alimentares saudáveis, uh, a healthy food environment at the school level and the household level as well. And uh, um, apart from the food environment, it, it, it is the, the diet, the consumption phase, of course, and it's not easy at all. And in this whole spectrum, in, uh, in uh, more or less uh, uh, level of influence, there are the majority of the uh, sustainable development goals of the, of the Agenda 2030. Of course, the, 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 the main objective, the main sustainable development goal is to end of hunger and poverty, but there are a lot more uh, which are related to the uh, short circuits, which are related to bioeconomy and uh, uh, the gender equality and so on. So uh, let's always remind that uh, the food system is a, a lot more than just food supply change. Next slide, please. Why focus? Uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, the lessons are for, uh, on one hand side, let's change the health system, but also let's change the food system. Why? Why to focus in the agri-food systems? Because there are huge things happening. Uh, uh, just imagine in a, in a world right now, one of five children are in condition of uh, stunted, uh, of stunning. One in five, okay? And at the same time, uh, more than two billion people are in conditions of overweight or, and obesity, yeah? And overall, as you can see, uh, uh, um, lesson or an evidence of the inequality that is happening in this world is that uh, we can distinguish three types of diets. The diet, like the uh, energy sufficient diet, the caloric diet in order to to, to be alive and to try to, 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 uh, to be okay in terms of uh, uh, energy, which is the, the lowest quality one. The other diet is the nutrition, the uh, nutrient sufficient diet. Uh, and the other one, it, it is the healthy, the, the healthy diet, okay? So this healthy diet is five times more expensive than an energy caloric sufficient diet and 60% more, uh, more expensive than a nutrient uh, sufficient diet. So, so we must change this. This is terrible. 
and this uh, is uh, uh, even worse with the pandemic effect. Yeah, a lot more people is going uh, to reduce the possibilities of uh, uh, of uh, uh, achieving a healthy diet and is just looking for uh, uh, or nutrient sufficient or uh, caloric diet. We, we must change that. Uh, the next slide, please. Well, the, uh, I, I said uh, this, uh, that, that slide was a uh, reason of, of, let's say, poverty and hunger. Right now, we are going to look at why to change agri-food systems because of the environment. Yeah? We are wasting food. We are using lots of water. We are losing, uh, we, we are using lots of uh, carbon, hmm? the footprint, the carbon footprint, the hydraulic or hydric footprint of the meals is huge. We have to, uh, to reduce it. Uh, ecosystems are disappearing uh, before our eyes. And uh, as the Antonio Gutierrez, the general secretary of the uh, United Nations says, humanity is uh, waging a war on nature. He also said food systems are one of the main reasons we are failing to stay within our planet's ecological boundaries. So we must change the way we eat, okay? Next slide, please. And apart from hunger and poverty, apart from environment, there is another reason why to change the agri-food system and it's what they represent in terms of employment and in terms of inclusion, yeah? The, they, they mean a lot of uh, employment, they mean a lot of uh, economy uh, uh, action, uh, economy activities in, in world level. Um, uh, as uh, it says, one billion people are employed through agri-food systems, production, harvesting, services, processing, and distribution, and another 3.5 billion earn their livelihoods through them, okay? So, uh, food systems are, are vital in economic uh, terms as well. Next slide, please. We can see the, how it's shared the employment generation in uh, agri-food system and 60% of all the agri-food system, 60% of the uh, strength or of employment uh, and livelihoods, it is represented in just the, the phases of the primary production, the food processing and food services. It, it means 60% of all the employment uh, generations. The other phases are, are meaningful, of course, but not as, uh, 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 as the uh, food production processing and services. Let's uh, recall as well that more than 80% of the extreme poor is living in rural areas. And of these, 75% earn some part of their living through agri-food systems. So where is the food? also is poverty. We must change that reality. Next slide, please. The, the, the challenge is uh, we have to, to transform. We need to change at planetary scale the food system. We need to define a collective pathway for transition to sustainable development. And uh, food systems means a lot in order to achieve the agenda, the 2030 agenda of the uh, sustainable development goals. There's no doubt about it. I think my, my time is, is uh, running, so let's go quickly for next time. We have to, the next slide, we have to bear in mind that besides this huge export potential uh, of Brazil, uh, also uh, we have to bear in mind, look at these products, but also bear, bear in mind all the vegetables. All the vegetables are produced by uh, family farming. In this case, in these exports, uh, uh, corn, uh, ethanol, uh, sugarcane is more from the agribusiness. But in, in, uh, in pork, 
in fruits, in, in, uh, in, in coffee. Uh, there is a lot of production of family farming as well, in, in chicken as well. But all the vegetables are produced by family farming. Uh, we have to bear in mind, uh, well, milk, uh, mandioca, feijão, batata, cebolla. It, it is produced by family farming, okay? Uh, next, uh, next slide, just to finish. And each Brazilian eats like uh, 100 kilos of meat each year. Uh, it, I'm not criticizing the amount of, uh, of, of meat. Just uh, I want to invite you to, to, to bear in mind that they, these animals have to eat something. So uh, the, besides the, the meat that we consume, there is a lot of water, there is a lot of consumption, there is a lot of agriculture. And this is just an invitation to uh, to bear in mind what it means the, the meal we are taking at, at, uh, at home, okay? I, I, I have a problem right now, okay. Well, just to finish, is uh, to remind you the, the, what uh, Bia told us about the, the food waste. Uh, in 2011, there was a study that said that one third of the meal is, is uh, uh, either food loss or food waste. Uh, they have uh, been uh, more studies and the, the amount is, more, is, is less, is uh, 14%. But from this 14%, the 25%, uh, the, sorry, from this 14%, the group of uh, food that is more wasted or in losses is fruits and vegetables. And this is the uh, 21, uh, um, this is the year 2021, the year, the international year of fruits and vegetables, and is the group of food with most, with the major level of food and uh, of food loss and waste. So uh, let's promote the consumption of fruits and vegetables, but also let's promote the reduction of food loss and food waste in the case overall in the fruits and vegetables. I will uh, end with this. Thank you very much. No talk about, you're not going to continue with this? Uh, 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 there you are, it finished. Thank you very <laughs> much, Rafael. It was very good. Thank you very, very much. I think you gave to, to your colleagues uh, on this screen a lot of stuff to talk about. And since you challenged um, as with the collapse of biodiversity and uh, what Dr. Gutierrez said about humanities in war with nature, I go straight to Marita Kokvizer to see because I know she is, has a lot to say regarding uh, exactly this war that uh, unfortunately we are with uh, biodiversity. Um, Marita, I'm going to take your presentation where you are. And uh, and then I I am at your disposition when you want you to pass. to go to full screen. Okay. And there you are. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, so I I thought I would take the subject of the session from the point of view of the conscientious consumer, uh, more in our um, affluent middle class part of the world because um, you know we we matter so much uh, in the in the numbers that um, Raphael was just presenting to us. Um, we are clearly on a perilous path second um, and we are in many ways uh, how can I get the next slide? Oh okay. We are on a perilous path to, um, towards reducing the very base of life. Um, and I think I don't have to repeat uh, this. This really connects to Raphael's uh, presentation. I mean, just, just take data on agricultural land that is lost, on water security that is lost every year with the um, destruction that's going on. 
But my argument is the argument of an optimist that as a consumer, we can uh, make a smaller footprint happen. Uh, right now, you know, you know the, 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 the footprint notion is that we use one and a half Earth per year and um, <laughs> there are just not one and a half or two planets and that we must reduce um, the base we use for our living and we must do it in a way that becomes more just, more equitable and does away with hunger, much in line with the sustainable development goals. Next, please. So as a consumer, you stand there in the middle uh, or in a supermarket and, and you say, so, so what do I do? I have to worry about biodiversity. Um, is, are the seeds hybrid or can they be reproduced? Are we keeping our varieties, also varieties of fruit trees? Um, who protects the intellectual property rights of um, uh, you know, wonderful bio food from uh, some indigenous areas on earth. What about the bees, which are uh, disappearing in many parts of the world? And in, in China, they've already done experiments with um, substituting for bee-based pollination uh, in, in mechanical ways. Turns out to be very difficult. Uh, we would love to know that we uh, use uh, tofu and uh, pork um, that has uh, soybeans in it from deforestation free product chains. We also worry about the social, fair pay, fair trade. Um, we want justice to vegetable and fruit pickers. And of course, even in the Corona times now, we found out <laughs> when suddenly those cheap workers, underpaid, often under-registered workers, can't come across the borders in the US or in Eastern Europe because of Corona, that uh, the whole system gets, uh, gets stuck. As a, as a consumer, I must worry about health, um, pesticides, herbicides. I must worry about the residual buildup of antibiotics in the meat, the poultry, the fish, and also, of course, in the water. Um, I must worry about eating meat, period. <laughs> For instance, I don't eat meat anymore um, because uh, it's, it's uh, I think the World Resources Institute just estimated that, um, you know, on, on average, you need 20 times the, uh, the amount of, of, of feed uh, to get to get the same caloric output with meat, you need 20 times as much in terms of meat, feed, and water. Um, so this obviously uh, is your footprint 20-fold. Um, now, we should not become ideological about this, but there are other people, other consumers who worry about animal welfare. They are consumers who worry about meat workers. In Germany, we had the highest incidence of corona disease hotspots in those meat factories. And then of course, there's the global commons, as you all know. Um, Bia and I work uh, uh, quite a bit on uh, Amazonia is one example, but there are many others on earth where deforestation is really um, demonstrably changing the climate. Uh, and this is not just leading to savannization, but also it's leading to changing weather patterns. In a country like Brazil, which is one of the so-called bread baskets on earth, a change in the water and rain regime means business and it can be bad business, and it can be misharvests, either from droughts or from floods. Um, of course, we have to worry about biodiversity and soils, and we have to worry about waste. And the, and the waste is not just the food waste, but as a consumer, I must uh, think about the energy that goes into transportation. I, I just love taking a sip of Evian water from Switzerland in the US 
uh, how much sense does that make? It could come from close by wherever we are on Earth. And of course, there's also waste in terms of the byproducts of all the food we take in. Uh, next, please. So uh, the points I want to make very quickly is that there are ever so many opportunities now to do better and that each single consumer matters. So um, save our seeds and all varieties. There is already quite a bit of research on indigenous knowledge from Mexico with all the corn varieties to Amazonia. But of course we could do much more to keep our options in nature, our options in biodiversity. A lot of this research is there, but it's slow, it's underfunded, while the indigenous knowledge among those uh, groups is disappearing as they modernize. Um, we need to protect intellectual uh, property and we need to uh, look at the credit system, the agricultural credit systems, which very often favor the mechanized and large systems and do not put a premium on bio healthily with less pesticides or herbicides produced food. Uh, bees and pollination, look, it, I live in Germany and, um, and we now have uh, new laws, new rules, and we leave edges at the, along the fields which are planted with flowers, wild flowers that bees love. And so uh, there can be active public as well as private and garden-based programs to make bees thrive again, survive again. Um, Deforestation-free product chains. Well, now the consumer increasingly can hope for electronic digital tracking from the field uh, on like Bia's chart from farm to fork from that farm somewhere in the world to your supermarket in, uh, in Paris or Berlin. Next. Uh, so many opportunities to do better also on fair pay, fair trade. Um, there are markets already, maybe they're not large enough, but where fair trade coffee or Peru puro chocolate uh, from well-paid uh, Peruvian farmers. Um, it, it's more expensive, but people pay for it. People pay for it because they have it in them Then for them the difference is not so big and they much rather uh, drink a coffee that, uh, that is not based on uh, so-called hunger loans. Um, and the same is true for vegetable and fruit pickers. Now on health, um, as I thought about it as a consumer, uh, I see still much more of a problem. There are labels, bio this, bio that, eco this, eco that, but we still, in the food chain, in the product chain, value chain, we don't have a clear picture. And much less when you ask me about the drinking water just out of the tap where I am. Um, there are certain elements which are filtered out and others not. And the way we produce food or the way we feed antibiotics, probably overly so, to, to keep animals healthy um, is a danger to ourselves. Next. Meat, um, whatever, 25 years ago already, we held a seminar, which was forest, the title was Forest for the Pigs. And I've always loved this notion. Uh, just take a country like Germany. Uh, they slaughter 50 million pigs a year for internal consumption and for exports. And these pigs eat soy from somewhere else in the world. And some of these soybean fields have been established over the last decades 
in places where there was natural rainforest, rainforest which today we know is just so precious for world climate and world biodiversity. I had mentioned the animal welfare, so we can, uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, the opportunities to do better are especially important for the global commons. You know, the, the, we have resources, we have one blue planet and we don't get a second one. And uh, if we compact soils with heavy equipment, instead of uh, doing more zero tillage and other alternative systems, um, this, this is simply not intelligent. We uh, know so much, we have such sophisticated methods at our hands, but we don't invest enough in them. Um, energy waste, I, I feel more optimistic about. I see many farmers, markets, um, the economy of the short distances coming along where um, you even have in, 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 in some parts of Europe a fake local currencies which can uh, you, you purchase a, a certain amount of this currency and then you can only spend it at your local store for products that come from within 50 kilometers of distance. And um, it, this has a big effect on, on increasing the production of local close by food. Um, and of course, then less energy waste uh, on large long distances. Ocean pollution, we could do more about because there is degradable plastic type wrapping now. We don't need those plastic bags that, that now accumulate at the bottom of the sea and endanger um, ocean production. Um, climate change, destruction of carbon sinks. Uh, we all know that um, policies, which we already have, if only they were um, enforced, um, would reduce the, uh, the cost of food production in a sense. Biodiversity waste may be one of the biggest wastes because we destroy biodiversity. Take the Congo Basin, take the Amazon, take a number of other such hugely important uh, environments which have the highest biodiversity uh, on earth and we destroy them before we've even researched them. We, we, it's like burning a precious library without ever having read the books. Next. Uh, I'm almost, uh, almost done. I want to just summarize some consumer hopes. So what can we do other than be aware of these options? One is to teach. We need more people who know sustainable agricultural production. Small farmers do, traditional farmers may do, but many modern farmers should also learn this. In some countries, in, in Europe, we have a few uh, agricultural colleges, universities that teach particularly sustainable agriculture. And of course, in Brazil, we now have the Rainforest Social Business School in, in uh, the state of Amazonas. And we are building together with Green Rio and the University of Sao Paulo, the Amazon Business School online. Um, we can develop new products. Um, we could invest uh, much more strongly and hope for more applied research and fair market development. And uh, as a backdrop to all of this, we need transparency credible tracking and labeling and the, the hammer, if things don't work, legal action. I, I only have to point to the huge cost to Monsanto buyer uh, for um, the uh, glyphosate um, scandal. Next. Um, small things also matter. Farmers markets, bio supermarkets. Europe is quite full of them by now. 
trade fairs like Biofach, um, and then of course uh, creating an informed and level playing field from the Green Deal policies in Europe to conferences like Green Rio in Brazil. Last, I want to mention something I've been associated with a bit, um, having been for long, many years on the board of WWF, the best in class labeling. So there are supermarket chains now, which try to not just put a stamp on it, fair and bill and so on, but, but who systematically contract the comparison of products, of eggs uh, and how the chicken live, etc., cetera, um, creating more transparency and, and um, you know, a quality seal. So the case I'm referring to is WWF and Edeka in Germany. Talk about sustainability in an overall way here for you. Then I'm very happy to be here. Since we are talking in this section about food chains and healthy challenges, I will give to you a big picture of our guidelines at the innovation area here at the Ministry of Agriculture to show you we here in Brazil are committed with this big challenge of integrating healthy environmental care and the need to feed the world. This is a big, big challenge. And first of all, as all of you already and talked about, we have to keep in mind the well-known future scenarios for agriculture. Globally, as we, as we know, it has been estimated that a 70% increase in food supply is needed to meet the needs of a population around 9 billion of inhabitants in 2050. And then agriculture producers are forced to increase productivity. And also we have the big challenge of the climate change that limits the production. And even more, we need not only more food itself, we need more nutrition, nutritive food, besides more water, more energy and so on, considering the sustainable use of all of these resources, as uh, Marita already told us. And Maria Beatriz mentioned the Brazilian National School Feeding Program. It's a big program that plays an important role in Brazilian national education and gives its broad uh, structure and context. It may serve as a guide for other developing countries. And inside this program, the Ministry of Agriculture has an important role on the food security. All the products of animal origin, including eggs, honey, and so on, require health evaluation. The Ministry of Agriculture has the responsibility to access these products healthily for the society. And uh, I need to mention too, that most efforts to combat the micronutrient deficiency in the developing country focus on providing vitamins and mineral supplements but we have another perspective, the introduction of biofortified crops, varieties bred for increased mineral and vitamin content itself. It could complement the existing nutrition intervention and provide a sustainable low cost way of combating the malnutrition. In Brazil, for example, we have the activities of the Harvest Plus Challenge program on biofortification and the AgroSalu program that are coordinated by the Brazilian Agriculture Research Corporation, which is a company linked to our Ministry of Agriculture. And inside this, this big challenge, we need to remember that the modern farmers are not only agricultural producers, but they, they are also quality food suppliers and ecosystem managers. And here with this big scenario here at the Ministry of Agriculture, we have a strategy to innovation and a strategy to match innovation with sustainability in a broader way. 
we have many subjects that compose the basement of our guideline of work here at the innovation area. We have sustainability, food security, food safety, and we know that in these pandemic times, food safety is a really important issue to the society. And if of uh, each of the subjects, we have some priorities. For sustainability, the main areas are related to the advances in innovation for agribusiness, and those advances are related to decarbonization, GAG mitigation, and the sustainable exploration of resources at all, as I said. And in the food security framework, we focus on the advances in productivity, efficiency, effectiveness, in the food deficit and also in the nutritional deficit, as I said, which includes strategies to overcome the hunger and malnutrition challenge, which also includes reducing the losses and waste. In food safety, we consider the need of technology advances, including the traceability to, to, to make the, the basement for the, the, the labels, as we, we already uh, talked about here, and which is also related to the certification issues. We have additional focus on the value capture, which means convincing and proving to the consumer about the sustainability in the food chain of the final products they buy. And the society, we, we aim to promote the sensibilization to the society about how good to the planet they can do if we prefer the consumption of sustainable products that can be made from our national biodiversity, but with a strong sustainable exploration. And inside all of this, the subject I, I told you, we have a strategy that we call Agri-Biodigital Agenda. The first strategic goal we have here is sustainability itself, addressing public policies for weather, promoting an environment for the development of new brands, new labels, trademarks that better communicate our already existing sustainability practices. And we want to associate those policies with technology that Brazilian institutions have been developing to monitor water, soil, climate change, and so on and more with the opportunities to develop more and more technology. We also have the second guideline, the bioeconomy, that includes innovative actions to take produce, to produce food, feed, the bio-based materials, bioenergy, and resources to optimize these products from renewable biological sources. And the innovative and sustainable technologies we aim include the most recent findings from chemical and biotechnological areas like genome editing, like the bio inputs. We, we, we strongly believe that the agriculture based on the bio-based solutions will be the future. And here, the third, the third subject we have as a guideline uh, is about the digital technologies in agriculture. Here, we want to promote connectivity to the farmers, developing initiative for virtual learning, promoting the development of blockchain agribusiness for using the traceability inside food chains, for using the agriculture of precision and similar technologies. Then we can prove sustainability and we can uh, um, manage it in a better way. The, the fourth is open innovation, as we can see here. And that's why we are showing this to the innovation business environments. We foster the startups that are dedicated to agribusiness. We are developing a strategy to have more and more innovation ecosystems dedicated to sustainability in agribusiness and to specific subjects like the bio inputs, like the bio-based agriculture. And inside this open innovation guideline, we want to promote more and more partnerships within Brazil and even outside. And the last, we have food tech. Um, food tech for us are, is the food for, or for the future. We include actions to research and developing for new ingredients, plant-based protein, cell-based, synthetic proteins to fermentation, vertical farms, packing technologies to 
to promote more um, products from the farmers to achieve a long distance. Then we have these five, these five bases of our agro bio digital agenda that comprehends all of the actions that the Ministry of Agriculture intends to promote in the field of innovation. And now I will show you just some examples of what we are doing in Pretzi and studying to cons consider those five points I presented to you. And the main, the main issue here is the sustainability and the bioeconomy point of view. As we already talked here, we know that the consumers, the society uh, are worried about its footprints. We have many uh, economic groups making commitments about animal welfare, about uh, reducing uh, GAG emissions, and we have those initiatives linked to science-based targets. This is our uh, big scenario and we are aware of it. And connected to this, we have our open innovation initiatives. This is just a, a, a brief uh, overview for you. We have programs at Embrapa, like the Bridges to Innovation program, where we can uh, have partnership to connect the agritechs. Agritechs for us are the startups that work in the agribusiness with investors with the aim of allowing them to have access to funds to accelerate the business, even to accelerate the business in the way of the sustainability, in the way of developing new technologies in this sense. And here I have some initiatives, uh, some examples for you uh, around about what we are developing here. And we know here that consumers are really worried about what they are eating. And here uh, we have ways of put the producer in a better way to provide that food in a sustainable way. The first is the ABC plan. The ABC plan means low carbon for agriculture and it's a credit initiative that provides low interest loans to farmers who want to implement sustainable agriculture practices. It, it gives, it gives a, a loan to the farmers to develop it, uh, it, it farm, to develop new crops, to develop sustainability agriculture practices. But, but we have even more. Embrapa developed in 2015 the concept of the carbon neutral Brazilian beef, we call CCN in Portuguese which is represented by a label referring to beef cattle produced under integrated systems with mandatory presence of a forestry component. And this concept aims to support the implementation of more sustainable cattle systems, especially regarding environment through the introductions of trees that are able to neutralize emissions related to methane emitted by the cattle and it ensures added value for beef productions under such systems. And we have two levels, the neutral and the low carbon Brazilian beef. And this is already at the market here in Brazil and we expect to, be, to, to, to grow a lot to other countries. Another example of um, public policy is our bio-based uh, solutions, the bio-inputs program we have, we call in Portuguese bioinsumos. This uh, is a strong initiative we have uh, about the bio-based economy. And about the carbon neutral and low carbon initiatives, we are start to study how to put these initiatives in another crops, in another um, products like soybean. We are starting a program about soybean low carbon and this is starting this year and we expect to have at the market soybean label with traceability uh, touched with low carbon. Well, just to give uh, you uh, uh, some details about the ABC plan, uh, Ah, não. Cadê você, Sibeli? Internet is conspiring. Oh. 
work. As I show here, uh, I we have some. Sorry. No, no problem because you you were frozen. Now you're back. Thanks God. Okay. Go okay. Uh, here we have some numbers. The plan for the consolidation of a low carbon economy in agriculture has already contributed to this number of the mitigation, more than 100 million of milligrams of CO2 equivalent in the period of 2010 and 2018, indicating that the targets for reducing GHG emissions are already being met. And now we want to go further. We launched the program ABC+. We have material in English to share with you. The program ABC Plus is a, a continui is the continuation of the first one, but in the second cycle of the ABC program, uh, we want to consolidate Brazilian agriculture as, as a sustainable powerhouse, firmly based on sustainable, resilient, and productive farming systems. Uh, the specificities about the, this new ABC plan will be launched in a few months. But we have already this strategy document in English we can share with you if you want. And in this second phase, the promotion of sustainable agriculture will continue to be a crucial aspect of the ABC plan, now under an integrated landscape approach, becoming even more resilient in addition to contributing to the mitigation of GAG. And to this end, the successful strategies that was already adopted in the first ABC plan will be increased and we will put it side by side with the science-based strategy to reinforce and to prove the metrics achieved. And this is a, a strong uh, priority of our ministry. And here, I just want to add to you another point of view of the opportunity to add value to the food chains using sustainability. This is happening now with the Brazilian beef, as I said in the label I showed you before. Brazilian was known um, as a big provider of uh, meat and known as ingredient. Meat not as uh, rec recognized as a premium meat. And we know all the countries are known as providers of premium beef, premium meat, as Argentina, for instance. But we believe that the consumers demonstrating, as since we could demonstrate in a certified label with traceability, with confidence, this sustainability, we can have even more value when, where the sustainable meat or the sustainable products, the, the products are produced in a sustainable way, we will have more value to the producer. We have more added value. And this is only the example with the meat in Brazil. We have the soybean um, being developed, but we have much more products. We, ha we have many, many, many more products that we could explore this kind of labeling and certifying strategy. And we have a, a strong ecosystem for this. And this, this, uh, this is not uh, only a, a strategy in a short period, but we want to give it uh, to society in a long overview. And this is the, 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 what I want to show you about the value chain, the, how could we add value using sustainability and those examples. And finally, I want just to give a brief overview of our national program for bio-based agricultural inputs, the bio-inputs program. Here, I need to mention that since the launch of this program uh, in two years ago, we have now more than 400 biological products available for the farmers. And then shows how strong and how uh, good it was the launch of the program. Inside this program, what we call, we call bioinputs any products, process, or technology originated from plant, animal, or microbial acting positively on crops, livestock, aquaculture, and forest system, and not just for production, also for use in storage and processing system, is a really broad uh, concept. And more, why, why we launched uh, this program here? because uh, things that we are already talking about here. We have Brazil as an important player and food supplier. We, we produce uh, food for the world equivalent to eight 
times the Brazilian uh, demand of food. It's a, a huge amount. We have, uh, as, we, as we already talked about, about 20% of the biodiversity of the planet and a huge number of collections of microorganisms already collected. And we are concerned about the sustainable exploration of this, but this could be the source of biobased solutions. And we have a lack of knowledge for this area, growers, technicians, and we use the program of bioinputs to, to teach this in the universities, to, to, to teach this in many other capacitation programs. And uh, the, the thing that we already know that the biological control and biostimulants market is growing really fast. I show you just some numbers of the source, the, source, the studies from Duhan Trimmer. The global growth rate is about uh, 15%. Is 10% of uh, it, it is being estimated that 10% of the crop market in 2000 to, to 2025 will be from bio bio based solution. This is a huge number uh, for this kind of solutions. Here, just some numbers to reinforce the growth that we are um, visual, visual that we have around the world, as we say here and in the 1978 1.5% of the the segments of the crop protection was from biological products it grows to 2.2 2.6 and we, inside the the each of of this we have uh, the stratification the bio nematicides bio insecticides bio fungicide but the main message here is that it's a, a growing market and a market that is good for the nature because they are bio-based solution reducing the use of chemicals and they are as good as the chemicals we already know this and the overall goal of the program is to expand and strengthen the use of bio inputs to promote sustainable development of the brazilian agriculture we have some strategic goals that we have many materials in english to to share if you want to, but we have the purpose to have a regulatory framework, encourage and to foster science, technology and innovation, have credit instruments for the farmers, uh, disseminate qualified knowledge and information about the production and use of bioinputs, including the production on farm, uh, training and capacity buildings on good practices of productions, which is also adding value to the sustainability strategy. We are encouraging implementation of biofactories and promoting policies, programs and plans in states and, and, and cities here in Brazil. We have many opportunities here. Uh, we have biological agent collections to develop it. We have the open innovation ecosystem where we can go deeper in the bioinputs, developing new bioinputs, as we are already seeing here in Brazil. We have to supply the supplier with process, technologies, assets, equipment, and we are concerned about the on-farm production with safety, but giving this alternative to the farmer. We have many, many QR codes here. The, this material will be shared with you. And then here we, you, you can access many materials in English about the program, about many other details if you want to, to go further. I, I just want to add, since we are talking about biodiversity, Zavala and Marita talking about, uh, uh, we are really committed with conservation of biodiversity here at the Ministry of Agriculture. I just want to add a, a data from FAO uh, that we know Brazil has 20% of the biodiversity of the planet, but uh, if we consider the overall biodiversity, this is a number of uh, eukaryotic organisms, what we have in agriculture, about 6,000 a comprehensive species from the agrobiodiversity. They are plants. About 200 are more utilized, but just nine, just nine species represent 66% of the, uh, the, the things we eat, the things from agriculture and the things we use for energy to in orange of agriculture. What this means? 
that our um, use of biodiversity is really a few, but we depend on only a few species. Then we need to conserve those species. And we need also to uh, look for others to complement the strategies to feed and to develop new products. Then we are committed to, to the conservation of species and we have uh, many uh, initiatives like this. And just to add uh, some numbers, I had during the, the presentation here, just to, to give a brief for you, our production in Brazil, these are numbers from the Ministry of Agriculture, is concentrated in the Midwest, South, Southeast regions, and Brazil uses only 7.8% of its territory for crops and planted forest, with 66% of its area preserved. And we have here in Brazil a strong environmental legis legislation that is one of the most restrictive in the world. Just an example in the Amazon biome, it's only possible to produce due to legislation in 20% of the property. This when it's not part of permanent preservation areas, such as riverside, close to springs and hilltops, for example. And it never hurts to remember that the Amazon biome has 84% of its native area preserved. We can do really better. We need to do really better. And the, the, the globe needs us, Brazil, to do really better. But we are um, trying to, to achieve this, this goal. I, I leave you a, a YouTube video here produced by our ministry in a partnership with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs that is good to see you after and this is what my, my big message a big picture of what why are we doing here we keep here at your disposal thank you very much thank you very much sibel i think you gave a, a good overall uh, let's try to to keep in touch after the event i have to go immediately to to liz walbun because um, we have a very strict time to answer to, uh, to the, set, the planetary health event. Well, Liz, you I have the responsibility of closing this panel and uh, I'm quite sure you're going to bring, we have all the information. Could you please start and show us why Food Nation is a reference in the food, <laughs> food chain? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, and all of you. Uh, thank you very much for being here for the invitation and for being able to present a Danish perspective in this very uh, important discussion. So I'll just share my slides. You can, um, you are going by yourself? Yes, I am. Oh, wonderful. I'm going by myself. Hopefully. So, uh, as uh, you know, my name is Lisa Velbom and I'm the CEO of Food Nation. And um, Food Nation is a public-private partnership. We're not for profit. And uh, so we are branding consortium working for the, all, the whole value chain of Denmark. Uh, and we are trying to do our best to share competences, products and solutions from the whole value chain. So if you want any more information after today, you're welcome to come to me and our organization and we'll try to match make you with the relevant stakeholders. And I'm also very happy that Bent Ingberg Mikkelsen is with us today and, and Maria already mentioned your great collaboration with uh, the university. And I highly recognize the importance of engagement of the youth in creating change, the necessary change that we are facing. So Denmark, let's just zoom in. Uh, it's a very small country, high up in the north. The spring is coming up now to us. This is why I have a spring cold, I'm very sorry. Um, but even though we are this small country, we do have a long track record as a food nation. So just to zoom in on where are we. And um, I would like to also highlight what some of the, um, uh, several of the speakers has already mentioned, and that is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This is what we share. These are the most important common challenges, common goals that have been set uh, in uh, these times. 
And of course, the agriculture and food industry has a vital role to play to realize these 17 development goals. So what I will do now is that I would like to zoom in on one of these goals, and that would be the, the goal number 12 about responsible consumption and production. And we have already heard from several of the speakers that uh, in many developed countries, a lot of people go hungry to bed. And at the same time, um, one in eight uh, persons uh, are actually overweight, and that is 2.2 billion people that are actually obese today. So we have a, a huge challenge here about the dietary change that was also mentioned by uh, Raphael earlier today. Uh, it is accelerated by the huge middle class, which is developing all over the world and demanding a lot of um, food and goods in their daily uh, work. This means that we do need to uh, raise our awareness on responsible consumption. It requires that we significantly lower the present food loss and waste, as we already heard from Sibel, and I think Mariata also mentioned this. So we need to focus on responsible production. We need to deal with the pollution of soil, air, and oceans in sustainable ways. And I would like to take you on a small and very quick journey to what some of the issues, some of the uh, activities, initiatives that we have taken in Denmark. So we have documented that since the 1990s, it has actually been possible in Denmark to raise production volume and at the same time reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So we have been working very, very focused on effective production from farm to folk. So in every step of the value chain, we have been focusing on how to, how to do this more effectively all the time. We've been doing it from a public perspective with legislation, uh, with, uh, with the rules for production, for handling manure in stables on landfills and so on. We've been doing it with technology as we also heard as a very important uh, guiding uh, tool from Sibel Silva. And we have been working all the way in the value chain. This is a picture from the primary sector. So it can be done and it has been done in Denmark. So we have been able to raise production volume and at the same time reducing the environmental footprint here measured by the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So it is possible to produce more with less input. This is a really important message, I think. And how did we get there? Well, let me just take you on a very quick historical journey. Starting in the 1882, where the first cooperative movement was born in Denmark. So this is where the, the farmers start to work together to be more effective across the value chain. Again, the cooperation across the value chain is a key right here. In 1888, Denmark was the first country to make pasteurization mandatory in the dairy production. This is about, of course, food quality and safety, putting us on the agenda here. And in 1971, Denmark was the first country to establish the Ministry of Environment. So this is to, just to let you all know that for so many years, we've had a very clear um, focus on the balance between the natural resources and the production and how to use the natural resources. If we move on, um, and now, apparently my screen is locked. If we move on, we take a big jump to 1987. Denmark was the first country to implement a state control organic label. We call it the red U. And um, you would not know it, but in Denmark, 100% of the consumers know this red U, this label. And this matches what Marietta said. We need to guide the consumers 
in the daily choices they stand as consumers what how can i choose in a uh, in a environmental friendly way this is one way of doing it <coughs> this is one tool and labeling and engaging of consumers has been a tool that we've been working with in denmark for many many years in 2010 uh, the danish restaurant noma was awarded as for the first time uh, the world's best restaurant and i would like to highlight this because gastronomy in in all in all and not only as a very high level uh, uh, gastronomy but gastronomy for all is also a way to secure food for all so all these very central strongholds the collaborative approach the quality and safety the high level of quality and safety the continuous documentation and data collection when we're talking about uh, quality and safety and also the environmental uh, framework very early stage the organic precision and the the gastronomy this is how we try to do our best to um, to work and and how we got to the place that we can say that we are a leading nation within sustainable and effective food production and let me just take you uh, a little bit further to um, to uh, show you where we uh, we have the um, the 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 whole uh, supply chain, the whole value chain here with us. And of course, um, it's important for me to underline that we need to look for business opportunities along the value chain. So when we do all this optimizing, we do need to look at business opportunities as well. So to reach the ambitious goals, everyone has to con contribute and we need to look into the possibilities in every step of the value chain, but we do need to take a business perspective as well. If I just share with you a few examples from the primary production, what is very much in focus right now in Denmark and in many other countries as well, is how to focus on plant protein. So we are working on how to get protein out of grass production so we can try to make local protein for our animals. Uh, but we are still also very engaged, of course, in the protein feed production in your part of the world. And we are very, very interested in the sustainable way that you are working with it as you uh, described Sibel Silva. If we look at the supply chain uh, infrastructure, of course, we have a strong, strong focus on how to minimize the input resources. And that is also to go for the processing and packaging. This is all about money, money talks here and business because it's good business if we can lower the input resources. And we have so many good examples in Denmark where companies has succeeded in reducing water input, electricity input, and in that way, making it a better, <coughs> a more sustainable production, but also more economically uh, better production. <coughs> Sorry. Take your time, take your water. <laughs> yeah, I'll just don't take it. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. <coughs> we are appreciating your presentation. Take your time. <coughs> okay. Let me zoom in on a very important example. <coughs> we can't we can talk while you get, you get back on trap. No, I'm fine now. I think I'm fine. Okay. Now. So the ingredient company Christian Hansen and a lot of other ingredient companies are working very specifically in how to contribute to the <coughs> to the food reduction. Food, food loss and waste reduction. And um, they, they have this really good example that um, we have this benchmark saying that 70% <coughs> of all yogurt um, in Europe is tossed to the bin because of the very short shelf life. <coughs> so if you actually add these uh, special bacteria culture, you can prolong the, 
the uh, shell life. And in that way, you can reduce the, food, the loss of yogurt with 30%. So you have really, really good opportunities in using these ingredients, these natural uh, ingredients in the food production. And this is not only about yogurt, this is also in all other kind of products. So we have a, an area here within the food ingredient sector, which we really need to look into. <coughs> Another example that I would like to highlight is the, the, the food app. Might, you might have heard about it. Um, this is a special focus on, for the moment, the, the consumers and would uh, highly need the situation that you were talking about, uh, Mariata. This is a company to good to go, um, which has grown uh, to be a world leading uh, digital company, assisting consumers to save meals. <coughs> so what the, con the, the concept is, uh, is that retailers kind of upload surplus food on a portal where consumers then can collect this surplus food. So in that way, we kind of save meals every day and all consumers that interact in this way, they kind of get the feeling and, and they actually do take responsibility in the uh, reduction of food loss and waste. So this is a very specific, very concrete uh, uh, and very good example of how to actually take action. So uh, as I said earlier, collaboration is key. If we do not collaborate across <coughs> the value chain, we will never succeed in reaching the 17 development goals. And we have a lot of good examples uh, in doing this. <coughs> I think there were so many interesting aspects raised by all of the speakers today. And uh, I think it would be really interesting to follow up on these uh, examples. Uh, at least uh, I would like to highlight one of the things that Rafael Savala highlighted that was a change of habits and the prices of a healthy diet. I think uh, you should all know that in Denmark, we have this year launched new dietary guidelines where we have incorporated climate, uh, climate guidelines. So we kind of guide consumers to uh, eat less meat eat more legumes, more beans, and so on. So we kind of try to guide the consumers in a, a carbon neutral diet. So I think we should all, you know, share these experiences and uh, try to be able to make the right choices, not the wrong choices. And I will, of course, encourage all of us to collaborate and uh, you are more than welcome to visit Food Nation Denmark um, and I'm really sorry about my coughing and so on, but I uh, hope that we can meet and uh, work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. I, I am, <laughs> and thank you for the effort I know you did to be here with us. Now you can take your water. I'm gonna send you some tea from Brazil to make easier your, your cough. And uh, thank you to each one of you. I wish we had more time to, to continue, but unfortunately, yeah, our slot time is really at the end, but uh, how can I turn enough to reach to Rafael, to Marita, to Liz, to Sibeli for defending so well our agriculture, congratulations. I think you, uh, you really represented Brazil beautifully. Thank you to each one, the contribution, Marita and Biodiversity, Rafael brought us so many the important dates and um, Liz highlighted the gastronomy, which I would like to, to, to say that gastronomy in school means a lot too. So if I can say goodbye, before I say goodbye, if each one of you could tell me just one word that comes to your mind after this meeting, and then I, I think I can finish with the last minute I have. Rafael, what's the word that comes to your mind after this meeting? Uh, let's make it possible. Let's, let, let's do it. Uh, okay, good. Cool. Uh, to fork uh, strategy is, is possible overall in Brazil, uh, which is a nation in which 70% of the population lives in small cities. 
Let's make it possible. Good. Marita, what would be your word? My word would be most encouraging. I mean, if I, if I just looked at all the concrete things that Sibel had on her screen, uh, of course, the challenges that Raphael put out and, and Lisa, I, I learned some new things. I uh, was very interested in your presentation as well. So I think that all of this is very encouraging because we need to scale. We don't have to invent so much. We have to scale some of the good stuff which is around. Perfect. Lisa, what is your word? I would say it is possible and we need to take action. Good, so positive words so far. Possible, encouraging, let's do it. And Sibel, what is your word? I will put a, a possible challenge. Possible <laughs> challenge, good, is the title of our event. Well, my word is gratitude for being here with you, for all the things you brought us and gratitude to everybody who is assisting us. And of course, uh, this panel must have a second round because it was so rich that we cannot stop here. I think it was a very, it had a match. So let's continue this match. And, and I wish you well, Liz, I hope you get well soon. And to each one of you, my best, my best regards. My, be safe, use the mask until the next time. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, the, the presentation will be available in Green Hill website. This is important for who is assisting us. We are going to okay. publish www.greenhill.com.br. Thank you. Bye-bye. Keep bye -bye. safe. Ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs>